Hello everyone, my name is Jelle. I'm a PhD student from uh, Cognitive Vision Group in Odense. Um, started in September uh, under the supervision of Norman Krueger. I was told that you uh, earlier this week uh, discussed different vision frameworks and I would like to start, and I'm going to talk about a framework called Kovis, Cognitive Vision Software. And I would like to start out with uh, motivation and uh, sort of put it into the map. Uh, now you know there's a lot out there, so why choose Kovis, why, why use Kovis? Um, it's a biologically inspired early cognitive vision framework. Early cognitive meaning that it's in the early states of cognitive vision, uh, inspired by, by what we know is going on in the human brain. Uh, it's built on top of concepts found, for example, in OpenTV. Uh, I assume you're familiar with OpenTV, <coughs> which is basically a huge library of um, well-known and common used image processing functions. And we use already a lot of them so uh, we link against Corpus. Um, and then I don't know if you are uh, familiar with PCL, Point Cloud Library. Uh, you could look at Corpus as a Point Cloud Library uh, because one of our stages is a Point Cloud, but it's an extended Point Cloud, and we also built on top of that. So if we look at the human brain, um, Visual information coming from the eyes goes to the back of the brain, the visual cortex, and is then processed initially by mechanisms looking very much like data filtering. Um, and this functionality is sort of shared. And after that, we go into different directions. There's the ventral pathway, which, um, which is uh, object recognition, it's our long-term memory, and there's the dorsal pathway where we um, associate actions to objects, understand the space around us. But the, what we notice that some mechanisms in the beginning are shared, and there's a hierarchy of information, so we go from this very low level, uh, just sensor, sensory input, to a higher level of um, abstractions in our information. So we try to condense information and at the end, understanding our um, surroundings as objects that we can interact with. Yeah, that's just, uh, if we flatten out the human brain, uh, it shows how much is actually used for uh, feature processing, uh, V1 in the back, and then out of the different pathways. So large areas are actually responsible for this feature processing and the hierarchy um, of visual information. And the distinction I'll try to make now, uh, often when you implement um, solutions where you use vision, you tend to look at your problem and then find out how can I solve this in a straightforward way in, with the mechanisms available in, for example, OpenCV. So you would choose some kind of feature and then try to uh, solve your, your given task. That we call a flat hierarchy. In the strategy with Corvus and what Corvus offers is a framework where you provide uh, visual information, and then it's processed in many levels. And you can then use the result of all these levels for solving uh, many tasks. Sort of like the ventral pathway and the dorsal pathway in the uh, human brain. <coughs> Feel free to ask questions if, uh, if you have any. The, the first levels are just a kind of pre processing. Exactly. So we like start from. Uh, Pixel information, then do some uh, uh, filtering. Uh, but uh, I'll come more into that. But yes, and then 
building on top of that, we do some edge extraction, we do uh, dense stereo, uh, extract different features. <coughs> It can be uh, different things. Okay. Uh, we are also investigating connect and other sensors. So but can also be just uh, ordinary images. Yes, for some of the features, yes, but for others we require uh, some cues for stereo. Uh, okay. But it is about the single image and get some information. Yes, definitely. <coughs> I'll show you that later. Of course, you, do, you can choose what information you uh, want to process. It's, a, it's still a complex system to use, but we are working on that, making it more uh, easy to use, and also the, of course, some speed issues. Because, well, over here, it's obvious you can do a very fast solution uh, if you just, you know, you have to do this kind of uh, FFT, uh, and then you can directly get your. you need to know from that. Uh, if we have to compete with that, we need to uh, be real time. So uh, I'll come back to that as well. <coughs> this is an example of a flat hierarchy just to illustrate uh, in biology the frog has a fly detector built into its Flat hierarchies in uh, would in the in humans be very inefficient uh, as we could not share the computational resources. Um, so it's definitely not flat. So now showing uh, different ways to extract features in our framework. Usually we would provide stereo images. We could also just provide a single image. Uh, or uh, RGBD images, which is inspired by the coming from the Kinect, this RGB color image and a D for depth image. Um, we would do some initial filter processing, uh, compute. So we have some nonlinear filters to uh, determine, okay, this areas of the images <coughs> is best described by lines, and others maybe by texture or. But if there's no information at all, we call it homogeneous. We also try to uh, distinguish corners where edges meet. Um, this shows the small baby, but the lines extracted in the image. <coughs> and here I show dense stereo. We use that for extracting patches, small surface patches in 3D. Combining that with these line segments that has been matched, also computed in 3D, we get a nice uh, representation with a semant which is semantically meaningful in the real world. This has semantic meaning. There are uh, it's the geometry of the actual object are stored in these primitives, and we can link them together to get these contours that describes the contour of the object. In the same way, we can link these small surface patches together and get the surfaces, or surface description of the object, uh, where information is available. So this is based on dense stereo, so where there's no uh, texture or structure in the image, we have no patches. The Kinect solves that by projecting a pattern to be able to do matching. The difference between these features and, for example, SIFT features is that we have a semantically meaningful interpretation at all levels in our uh, in our representation. So at all levels, it sort of makes sense. We we can it describes what we see. 
Also, we have appearance information <coughs> associated, so that's why it's more than a point cloud at this point of processing. Uh, because, of course, there is a point, but there's also for the lines and orientation, uh, as well as for the surface patches and normal, and color information and uh, yeah, different measures coming from the image. This is an overview of the features that we imagine could uh, be a sort of complete representation, but uh, there might be more. We have homogeneous patches, edges, junctions, and texture. I uh, don't think I'll spend more time here. Some information on what we actually store with a 2D line segment. So this we could uh, compute just from a 2D image. Uh, from the filtering, we do something very similar to uh, edge extraction. We have a position in the 2D image, an orientation, so an, an angle of the line. We have the face, which is the transition going from one color to another. Uh, the color on each side of the line or edge. And then we store some information about optic flow. And this leads us to this uh, representation of a of a line segment. Uh, what, uh, what does optic flow uh, mean? Optic flow? Isn't uh, just a, a single image? Or is it? Well, uh, and, and I think it's multiple images. Okay. Where okay. it's heading. The face, so that can have the width of the transition or? Yes, it's the measure of the width. Uh, I, I, I think I didn't need to describe, describe that, but uh, uh, you can tell what kind of edge it is, whether it's an edge or actually a line, you also have to be distinguished, so if there actually is something uh, thin dividing two areas of two colors, then we have a threshold where we say, okay, now it's a, it's a line or an edge, so transition from one color to another. And then going from two uh, 2D images with calibration, we can do matching. And if we have a match, something we believe is a match, uh, we can re reconstruct a 3D <coughs> segment, which gives us this parameterization. Uh, for the position, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we all do that. For the others, there are some special mechanisms we use. For example, how to reconstruct the orientation and we, we get a reference plane where we assume the line will be lying in, which depends on the, the viewpoint that we have. So there's a lot of technicalities. How do you perform your stereo matrix? Is that based on uh, the 2D primitives? Yes, it's based on the 2D primitives itself. So we actually match each, uh, so they are not sorted at this stage, so we match each, each uh, line segment in one image with all of the others, and we try to find the best match. And of course we can apply the, the usual constraints, um, but we can't gain speed in terms of searching. Um, what if you haven't uh, located exactly the same location? In both images. Um, yes, of course, we have a problem with sampling. Uh, we want to uh, <coughs> to condense information. We want to sample and represent using lines. So uh, we have to have some measure of how similar are they from cost function. And of course, they'll never be exactly on the equipolar line. But if they're close enough, then we accept the best match. And with this representation, you can also triangulate. Uh, yes, we do tri triangulation. Uh, you can extrapolate uh, if they don't match. Exactly. You can so we, we can. Uh, uh, yes, we also have means for doing that. We have the, the contours where we link uh, line segments that are collinear. Link them together. Yes. 
So this is all very nice. Uh, it's been used in many robotics contexts, but how do we uh, compute it fast enough? So we don't want the robot to be standing there waiting for us to uh, do several minutes of computation. So we uh, came up with this pipeline approach. Having high resolution cameras, <coughs> we uh, implemented some pre-processing on GPU. And all this uh, initial filtering pre-processing, meaning uh, images coming from the camera are in via pattern for uh, best use uses of bandwidth. So we have to do some debiarization to to get color images. We have to do undistorted rectification. Our dense stereo methods require that. Our uh, line features also benefit from that. It's easier to do matching. So we do undistorted rectification as you We do the initial filtering, and already here we divide in two paths. Uh, one of them giving us the line segments, and the other giving us um, the patches. And also here I visualize uh, stuff like uh, that's called, that's called independently moving objects, independent motion from another project. And this system, it so of course it depends on the parameters, how many features we extract. Um, but at the right parameters, we are able to run at between 5 hertz or maybe up to 20 hertz, also depending on the size of the images uh, and, the, and the version of the GPU. So the newest architectures are the, the fastest. So, so where do you have your uh, where the, the part there? Yeah. We spend a lot of time on the, on these, which is still on CPU. These uh, these two uh, D feature extraction and three D matching. And that takes time in this context. The GPU and all this pixel based information is extremely fast. Yeah. So the they're going to also okay implement that uh, last part in GPU. There has been attempts, but uh, some of the mechanisms are very hard to implement on GPU. Want to uh, where you also gain speed, uh, gain speed, you can of course implement it on GPU, but uh, the algorithms are not uh, do not map very well to the architecture. <coughs> And then there's the compromise. How, how much do you want to compromise your algorithm in order to gain speed? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, instead, we are trying to, of course, utilize many core, uh, multi core CPUs yeah. uh, because that's definitely possible. <coughs> yes, and to uh, illustrate some of the systems where we uh, used Corbis as a sort of input or, uh, for different applications is this driver assistance system where we extract for instance uh, these the li lines in the road and use that for guiding the car or the driver of the car and also we could detect approaching cars obstacles there's been different robot applications one where we know we know the object that we are looking for, but we want to be very fast and precise. We want to put a ring on an oscillating hook, moving on a conveyor belt. Uh, so there you have to be uh, in real time to do that. And then uh, for different uh, birth of the object and uh, building models of objects, by exploration. And how do we do that? Um, yeah, that's another image of how we implemented the pipeline. I won't spend more time on that. So if you have questions, you can ask. Uh, basically, it just shows
some parts are on GPU, some are divided GPU, CPU. Then we have a special buffer system to uh, synchronize uh, the different stages. So it's sort of self-synchronizing. We, we trade off uh, latency for the frame rate. Yes, that's what I want to talk about. Having these features, we uh, can do different relations, a few different relations between them. For instance, in the same image, we can compute collinearity between line segments. Over stereo images, we can compute, of course, a stereo context matching. Uh, in the temporal context, so at, at the next frame, we can um, detect the motion. And then there's coplanarity and co-colority, so having same colors or lying in the same plane. All these uh, relations we can use for grasping the objects or other tasks. And in the example of grasping, here is shown different very basic grasps that can be detected from just a very simple relation between uh, contours based on line segments. This is an example of doing solving tasks based on these representations. And again, here, based on line segments, we can suggest these different ways to grasp. But of course, there might be actually something in this area so that we can't detect with lines. Um, maybe that can be, if we have structure in the area, we can describe that uh, with the surface. So our surface patches, which is uh, quite new, concept in our framework, we can um, compute better graphs based on that. Yeah. Your surface patches, are they, they can also be generated from stereo images? Yes. The problem we face is that oh, sorry. if there is no information in this area, if it's completely homogeneous, then we rely on the stereo algorithm to do either some uh, extrapolation or uh, uh, yes you could either do that or there are some dense stereo algorithms that do it inherently that it just okay. that's the way it works it will by a cost try to yeah, smooth, smooth things out okay. uh, uh, what's it called belief propagation would try to do that so if you, it will detect the, the edges or where there is information and then it will try to make areas in between as smooth as possible. Yes. Uh, but of course that's an assumption, you, know, you don't know if it's true. Uh, the Kinect solves it by uh, uh, using structured lighting. Yeah, uh, other applications uh, we can do grasping, as I showed you. Pose estimation. We uh, if we can uh, build models based on these line segments, and then we can do um, try to fit the known models in the in the scene, and actually successfully do pose estimation on that. And also object learning, so we can learn the object if we grasp it, and then rotate in front of the camera, and that's what I'll be talking about later. Uh, we can learn automatically a model of the object. And some other applications. Also, uh, doing motion estimation. Here we uh, did some work on combining the line segments and shift features for motion estimation, because it turned out that shift features are strong in some scenes, 
and line segments in other scenes. Uh, this is an example of uh, a scene where SIFT features, where there were simply two Q SIFT features um, extracted reliable enough to be able to do uh, robust motion estimation. But as you see, uh, can imagine that these lines are very reliable. So uh, by combining our primitives and the SIFT features, we simply show that we get more precise in our motion estimation. And that we can use uh, when we want to do object learning. We don't have to know the motion of the object in advance. We can compute and then uh, apply a camera filter to build up a reliable uh, model. I'll come back to that. We call it accumulation. Basically, what is shown here, these are accumulated models of different objects, only using the lines, line primitives. Just skip this. And here I show just the, some work done by some master students where they introduced junctions, sort of connecting line segments. So the framework is generic in that sense that you can introduce your own features and also uh, apply the, some of the uh, more advanced or higher level mechanisms on these features. And this is the next thing I'll be talking about, maybe after a short break, accumulation, where we Extract features, you see the texture, pa texture patches, junctions and edges, and then we accumulate over time, use the temporal information um, to gain accuracy and precision in our model of the object and remove outliers. And by that we get, okay, this is not the best example, but we get a more complete, I don't know if you can see this model. Um, these lines are more complete over here. It's a more complete model. Uh, and in this platform, we're going to do some work using this framework. The, uh, it's a new started project where two robots um, must. Okay, our camera system looks at a human putting together, uh, doing some assembly operations, um, putting together some objects to uh, a small uh, model. That's a, it's a benchmark model called the Cranfield benchmark. And the system looks at that, understands what's going on, and then translates that to something meaningful for the robot arms. Um, not copying the motion itself that the human does to do this, but understanding, okay, what's important here by introducing scene graphs and so understanding, okay, what's the important thing going on in the scene and then tries to imitate that. Um, it will also involve um, pick and hold and screwing quite high precision by the vision system. Yes, I just want to mention that our software is uh, publicly available, still uh, heavily under development, but you can look at it if you want to. Um, and this is the group working in the area. And some familiar faces. And that's the end of this. I don't know if we should have a short break before I, I'll talk about